Guys, last time we talked about the two presidents that closed out the 20th century for the United States, um, George H.W. Bush, Herbert Walker Bush, and Mr. Bill Clinton, President Bill Clinton. These are the presidents during the 80s, the late 80s, and the, and the 1990s, and they're going to be the ones closing out the century for us. Today we're going to be moving on to the first two presidents of the 21st century of the 2000s, George W. Bush and Barack Obama. Um, this is basically modern time. And most of you have lived through um, these two presidencies. All right. For that, let's talk about the election of 2000. This is the election that is going to win President George W. Bush the presidency. George W. Bush is the president's son. These are the people who were running during the election of 2000. This is one of the key things you need to remember for today because this is a favorite question on your EOC. Al Gore was the nominee for the Democrats, and then you have Ralph Nader running as a third party candidate. Remember what I told you about third parties? They don't often win elections, but they do play a major role in the outcome of those elections. So these are the three people running for election. What was so characteristic about, about the election of 2000 is the fact that it was such a close election. It was a very, very close affair. Not a third party candidate, never had a chance. Ralph Nader never had a chance, but it was close between the two major parties, the Republicans and the Democrats. So something that you need to know, and I've talked to you about this very briefly, but I'll review again, is how we elect or select who's going to be the next president of the United States. Because in two years, most of you will be 18. And in two years, you're going to be able to select for the first time in your life the next president of the United States in 2020. So here's how it works. Each state is given a number of what we call electoral votes. What doesn't happen is when you go to the voting booth and you pick Donald Trump's name, you do not directly cast your vote for Donald Trump. It does, it's not simple like that in the United States. In other countries, Everybody votes. Whoever gets the most votes becomes the president or becomes prime minister. In the United States, it's not the case. You are not directly casting your vote for a candidate. What you're doing is you're telling your state who you want them to give the electoral votes to. Each state is given a number of electoral votes depending on that state's what? Population. population. The bigger state is, the more electoral votes your state has or the more influence your state has over who becomes the next president of the United States. The goal of the electoral college system which was set up by our founding fathers in the Constitution of the United States is you need to get more than half of these. So if you add all these number up, divide it by two, then add one, that's the majority of electoral votes. And that's what somebody needs to get, a candidate needs to get in order to become the next president of the United States. Today, that number is 270. And if you look at who won this election, he barely made it, 271. But the goal of the electoral college system is to get the majority of electoral votes. Once you achieve that, you are now the next president of the United States. So what happens during presidential election is, in a state, people go out and vote. Let's pretend we are Texas. Texas in 2000 has how many electoral votes up for grabs? It has 32 electoral votes up for grabs. If 80% of the Texans voted for George W. Bush, the Republican, and 20% voted for Al Gore, the Democrat who won Texas? Bush. Bush. So it's usually winner takes all. So whoever wins the election in that state grabs all of that state's electoral votes, which means all of our 32 electoral votes will go to who? Bush. It will go to Bush. What does Al Gore get? Nothing. Al Gore gets nothing. But it can also work this way. It could be that the election was very close in Texas. Let's say 51% of us here voted for Donald Trump and 49% voted for Hillary Clinton in 2016. It's a very close one. But it's winner takes all. Who won in Texas? Donald Trump did. So he gets all the electoral votes. What does the loser get? The loser gets nothing. Despite the fact that almost half the state voted for the other person, she doesn't get anything. Because this is the winner takes all system. The idea behind the Electoral College is we should not have direct say on who becomes the next president of the United States because we were too stupid to make such a decision according to our founding fathers. 
um, they didn't want us making that direct choice of who becomes the next president. The Electoral College is supposed to be the one to make that choice for us. All right. So as the election went down, it was a very close affair. And it all came down to one state, the state of Florida, with its 25 electoral votes. So it came down to Florida. Whoever wins Florida will get enough votes to get over that 270 that they need. Whoever wins Florida will become the next president of the United States. So for example, in 2000, without Florida, Bush would have never got the 271 that he needed. Subtract 25 from 271. What would that be? 246? Is that correct? Let's pretend that's correct. All right. And Al Gore had 266. So they, it's all, it all comes down to Florida. Whoever wins in Florida grabs 25 electoral votes. And we add that to this 246, which can make George W. Bush president. Or if Al Gore wins Florida, we add that to 266, then Al Gore becomes the next president of the United States. So it's all Florida. In Florida, the election was super close. At the end, they were separated by 500 votes. Just a couple of votes. But George W. Bush was declared the winner in Florida. So he becomes president. However, not so fast, because in Florida, there is a law that if the election ever gets that close, if they're only separated by a couple of hundred votes, then we need to have a recount in Florida, which means that they're going to count the ballots by hand make sure the guy that actually won, actually won. So Florida law mandates that if the election ever gets that close, they're going to do a recount. The governor of Florida stopped the recount. The governor of Florida during that time, his name is Jeb. What do you know his last name? Jeb Bush. He's, the, he's George W. Bush's brother. And he stopped the recount. Because again, he wants his, his brother to become the next president of the United States. So Al Gore sued Florida, and we get the court case Bush versus Gore. So George W. Bush won by a narrow margin, a very narrow margin. Since it was so narrow, Florida law mandates a recount. Florida law mandates a recount. When Florida didn't do the recount, Al Gore sued, and the Supreme Court has a choice now. Either they let the recount happen, and Al Gore has a chance, or they block the recount, and who automatically becomes the next president? Bush becomes the next president of the United States. The Supreme Court blocked the recount. The Supreme Court did not let a recount happen. They reasoned it was too late, it was going to be too expensive, but the Supreme Court blocked the recount. Automatically, George W. Bush becomes the next president of the United States, this is despite the fact that the federal, um, Florida law mandated a recount. So here's the sketchy thing about all of this. The Supreme Court has nine justices in the Supreme Court. This came down to a 5-4 decision. Five of the justices decided that we don't need a recount, so they blocked the recount. And four of the justices wanted to follow Florida law and have a recount. Those five justices happened to be Republican justices in the Supreme Court. George W. Bush was what? Republican. He was Republican. So they blocked the recount, essentially declaring President Bush or or shall be Bush at this time, the president of the United States. The Supreme Court had a Republican majority. The Supreme Court had a Republican majority. This is why the result of this election is so controversial. There was family involved, and there was politics involved. A lot of people just thought that the Supreme Court's decision was not made based on the Constitution of the United States, 
it was made out of partisanship, out of politics, because George W. Bush was from their party. All right. So this is going to be uh, a stain in George W. Bush's presidency that a lot of people did not feel like he was the legitimate president of the United States, because that recount didn't happen. All right. There's something that can happen in your country because you use a very weird system in choosing who's going to be your next leader. I know you can't see this very well, but those of you that can, look at the vote count. These are called the popular votes. This is how many people actually voted for the candidate. Red represents Republican, blue represents Democrats. George W. Bush, the Republican, got 50,455,000 votes. While Al Gore, the Democrat, got 50,000,000 Nine hundred ninety-two thousand votes, which means what? Al Gore won the popular vote. Al Gore won the popular vote, which means more people voted for Al Gore than they did George W. Bush. But it's not about getting the most votes. It's about winning the key states that you need in order to get the majority of electoral votes. So even though George W. Bush did not get the most votes, he still won the presidency. So George W. Bush won the presidency despite losing in popular votes. Despite losing in the popular votes. It's like what happened with our last election. Last election, it's the same thing that happened. Hillary Clinton got three million more votes than Donald Trump did, but Hillary lost the election. Because again, it's not about getting the most votes, it's about getting, winning the key states that you need, no matter by how much. It doesn't matter if you win Florida by two votes only, you get all of Florida's 25 electoral votes if you win it. It's electoral, it's winner takes all. So there was also questions about what the Supreme Court did, whether or not a Supreme Court should be able to essentially do what they did, which is choose the next president. So it brought into question whether or not the Supreme Court should choose the next president, which is essentially what they did in Bush versus Gore. The Supreme Court shows, essentially, he's going to be the next president by blocking the recount. And whether or not politics or political parties played a role. Whether or not the fact that the Supreme Court justices are from the same party as the president or as the president they're going to declare to be president played a role. So whether or not politics or partisanship, that means political parties, played a role. So this was a highly contested election. The funny thing is, is all of this would have never happened. All this controversy surrounding Florida and whether or not a recount should have happened would have never happened if this guy right here didn't run. So we'll talk about that right now. I told you before, third parties don't often win elections. They don't. If you don't have a D or an R next to your name, it is almost impossible for you to win any office. Republicans and Democrats dominate our government. We have a two-party system. It doesn't mean we don't have other parties. We do. They're called third parties, but they're ineffective during election time. They don't have as much support as the Democrats and Republicans, so they always lose elections. Today we have the Libertarian Party. We have the modern day Whig party, we have the Libertarian party, the Green party, the Marijuana party in the United States, but they do not often win elections. But what the state of Texas wants you to realize for your star is even though they don't win elections as much, they do have certain importance. They have three things that they can do. Number one, they provide another candidate that represents another viewpoint. They provide another candidate that represents another viewpoint. Maybe you don't agree with Bush, and maybe you don't agree with Gore. Ralph Nader is there for you. Another person that represents your own viewpoint. So maybe you didn't like Trump, and maybe you didn't like Hillary. The Green Party had a candidate, and the Libertarian Party had a candidate. Maybe they're closer to your viewpoint. But the sad thing is, is you can vote for those guys, but you should know, especially in presidential elections, is they're not going to win. So essentially, you wasted your vote. Number two, 
Number two, in a close election like in 2000, a third party candidate can become what we call a spoiler, can become a spoiler. He can ruin the whole thing for one candidate. He can become a spoiler. All right, let's review. How close was the election in Florida? How many votes separated them? 500 votes. It would have been closer if they did the recount, but they're separated by 500 votes. And with an election where millions and millions of votes were casted, 500 is very, very narrow. However, in Florida, 100,000 voters voted for Ralph Nader instead. Voted for this guy over here. Essentially wasting their vote because they know he's probably not going to what? Not going to win. Imagine if Ralph Nader didn't win. A lot of these 500,000, uh, 100,000 voters, a lot of them would have probably voted for Al Gore. And the outcome of an election would have never been in doubt. And he would have won Florida, essentially giving him the presidency. But because Ralph Nader chose to run, even though he knows he's doomed, he took away some votes from Al Gore, which enabled George W. Bush to win that presidency. Anybody have any questions on that? So one of the important, the other important third parties is in a close election, third party candidates can become spoilers. They can take away votes from a major party candidate. They can take away votes from the major party candidate, just like what Ralph Nader did to Al Gore. They can take away votes from a major party candidate. All right, the third thing is, Sometimes a third party comes up with a great idea, with an issue that people are concerned about. So they can raise issues not being talked about by the major parties. They can raise issues or ideas that are not being talked about by the major parties. During the progressive era, that we, the thing that we talked about today, the Socialist Party of the United States, came up with the idea of, or they were advocating for, a minimum wage. The Democrats, the Republicans, nobody was talking about that. It was the Socialist Party that gave attention to that issue, a minimum wage. But here's the sad thing about third parties that you need to remember. Sometimes they do come up with good ideas that attract a lot of voters. But if enough voters are attracted to that idea, what happens to that idea? Uh, it gets taken away by a major party. The Republicans take it or the Democrats take it. And if you were a voter, why would you vote for a major party candidate instead of a third party candidate? So let's say you believe in the minimum wage. There's a socialist party right here. The Republicans see that the minimum wage is gaining a lot of steam to the voters, so what do they do with it? They adopt it and they borrow it in their platform. Why would you be more likely to vote for the Republican than the, special, the, the Socialist Party? So you don't waste your vote. You don't waste your vote. Because who's probably going to win? The Republicans are probably going to win, so you vote for the Republican candidate. That's why it's so difficult for third parties in this country to get a foothold. All right. This is what defines George W. Bush's presidency. 9-11, September 11, 2001, we get an attack by a terrorist organization known as Al-Qaeda. Four airplanes were hijacked, two landed on the World Trade Center, one landed on the Pentagon, the other one the passengers were able to steer away from their target. But this is a catastrophe unlike ever before in U.S. history. You have never been attacked not like this. The last time a country invaded us was War of 1812, when the British burned Washington, D.C. For 200 years, we felt we were safe in this country. World War I, World War II, Vietnam, Korea, nobody's attacked us in our own homeland, in our own soil. This was a very traumatic moment in U.S. history. And it's going, it's going to cause 3,000 lives, 3,000 deaths, 6,000 injuries. 
3,000 Americans will be dead by the end of that day. But the impact of this trauma is more important. What we choose to do as a country after this is going to be more important. This is going to start what we call the war on terror. The war on terror. It's going to make us and our government do very questionable things. All right. The war on terror involves all this. I'll post your notes online, don't worry. But one of the primary goals is to defeat the people responsible, which would be Osama bin Laden of Al Qaeda and Abu Musab al Zawari of Al Qaeda. Destroy them and destroy their organization. Eventually, we'll meet both of the goals. Second goal is prevent another terrorist attack from ever happening again. We got paranoid. Prevent another terrorist attack from ever happening again. This preoccupation with making sure something like this never happens again is going to make the United States do very questionable things. Things that our founding fathers would probably cringe at as we go along. All right, so one of the things the US government did is it established a new department, so the Department of Homeland Security. The goal of Homeland Security is to protect the US borders, make sure something like this will never happen again. In the name of the war on terror, because Al Qaeda was based in the Middle East, again, this is our old sins coming back to haunt us. The United States intervention in the Middle East has made that region very, very unstable. And it caused a lot of these terrorist organizations to pop up in the Middle East. But this is something that we probably started indirectly. But in the name of the war on terror, we're going to go to war with two countries in the Middle East. Osama bin Laden, we believe, was hiding in Afghanistan with the Taliban. So we invaded Afghanistan in the early 2000s. Some of your parents or maybe your uncles or relatives may have served um, in Afghanistan in the early 2000s, in the mid to early 2000s. And then our old friend, Saddam Hussein, the leader of Iraq, what did he do in the 90s? What did he do in the 90s? What did this guy do in the 90s? He invaded what? He invaded Kuwait, which forced the United States and a bunch of other countries to try to free Kuwait and invade Iraq. But at the end of that, um, he got he remained in power, if you all remember. President George W. Bush got intel that Saddam Hussein and the Iraqis were developing and hiding um, weapons of mass destruction, which is something they weren't supposed to be doing according to the, the treaty that they signed. So, with that reason, we go invade Iraq so that we can stop them from developing and using weapons of mass destruction. We beat them very easily, just like the first time. But this time around, we were mostly alone. We had a couple of allies, like the British. But there were people that joined us originally in the 1990s that were not in agreement with us during this time, because they felt like we didn't have enough evidence to actually warrant an invasion, that we didn't have enough evidence that they actually have weapons of mass destruction. The French didn't join us, they used to, uh, they joined us last time, they didn't join us this time. When we get there, and we beat them, we tried hard to look for these weapons, we found nothing. There were no weapons of mass destruction. The reason why we invaded Iraq, and the reason why a lot of these, a lot of our American soldiers were put in harm's way and a lot of them died, wasn't a thing. Our government had faulty information. They may not have lied, 
but they didn't check their sources properly enough. This is the same thing back then during the Vietnam War with the Gulf of Tonkin incident where they lied to the American people and that's why we went to war in Vietnam and escalated the situation in Vietnam. In this case, some of your relatives may have died or may have been injured all for nothing because Saddam Hussein and Iraq were not really developing weapons. This was a disaster for the Bush administration, so they kind of tried to double back. They said, oh, we're not really just looking for weapons of mass destruction. We also want to impose, oh, we also want Iraq to be democratic. So we're spreading democracy. If you all remember, this was the reason we used for World War I. This was one of the reasons we used for World War II. We're spreading democracy. But that's what happened. Um, after we found out there was no weapons of mass destruction in there, we kind of double, um, double back and said one of the reasons is we're spreading democracy. We're toppling a dictator. All right. All for the sake of the war and terror, we're going to do very questionable things. We're going to be arresting people without a warrant. Anybody know what amendment does that violate? Because we're so scared of terrorists during this time, we wouldn't be just arresting people we suspect of terrorism without warrants. Anybody know what amendment? Freedom from reason, uh, from cruel and unusual punish. Oh, freedom from unreasonable search and seizure is the fourth amendment. We're going to be putting people in detention centers without warrants, without due process. We're going to be torturing people suspected of terrorism because they may have information that can save people's lives something that is against the Eighth Amendment's protection against cruel and unusual punishment. So we're going to be doing a lot of things that may be questionable when it comes to civil liberties. One of the things that's very controversial, even today, is that the U.S. government, after 2000, 2001's attack, passes a law called the Patriot Act. The goal is to prevent another terrorist attack. But the means to do so is the controversial part and how the United States government will try to achieve the safety is going to be the controversial one. Yes, sir. U.S. Patriot Act did. It gave federal agencies like the NSA, the FBI, and the CIA broad surveillance capabilities. Broad surveillance capabilities. Basically, spying powers. So, the goal is to keep track of communication that's happening in the United States and to identify certain people that may be communicating with people outside of the United States that have terrorist ties. So by taking your information, whenever you text somebody, whenever you email someone, that data is collected by the federal government and analyzed by the federal government. What they're looking for are for certain trends. Maybe you're communicating a lot with somebody from Afghanistan. Maybe you're communicating a lot with somebody from Pakistan. They can identify those communication, and they can hopefully find something that might prevent another terrorist attack. But again, the question is whether or not this violates your what? Right. Your privacy. Your privacy, your civil liberties and your privacy. They are collecting your data. The government says that they're not interested in the content of your data. So if you send a dick pic, for example, they don't look at the picture. All they care about is who you're sending it to, how long is the communication um, for, uh, how, how long is the communication for, and how often do you talk to that person. However, it's been revealed that sometimes the government does look at the content of the data. All right. 
So the impact is today we have debates, and this is something that you're going to have to figure out for yourself and grapple with as you grow up. What is going to be priority? What's going to be more important to you? Is it going to be protecting your civil liberties, making sure that they're a part of your lives that the government doesn't mess with or doesn't control? Or is protecting people's lives more important to you? This is going to decide who you're going to vote for next election. Republicans tend to support national security, even if it means sacrificing some civil liberties. And Democrats think that it's not worth it. Civil liberties should be protected. It does, um, it's not worth, it's not worth, national security is not as important as civil liberties. All right, another thing that happened during George w, uh, w. Bush's time is the flooding of New Orleans. In 2005, the state of Louisiana and its biggest city, New Orleans, a hurricane came through, it's called Hurricane Katrina. And the result of the hurricane is the entire city drowned. Infrastructure gone. The whole city was underwater. There are many reasons for this. Some of them are geographical and physical reasons. So one of the reasons is the hurricane itself. The hurricane was bringing with it strong winds, precipitation, so flooding may have been inevitable, but Hurricane Katrina was one of the main reasons. This was a terrible hurricane. Part of the reason is New Orleans right now is under sea level. It's below sea level. Katrina, I'm sorry, New Orleans is below sea level. If New Orleans is below sea level, why is it flooding right now? Wall. Sorry? Wall. Wall. Kind of. <laughs> we call it something else though, but you're right, it's essentially a wall that prevents water from coming in. What do we call the, that wall that prevents dam. water from coming in? A dam. What we call levee. So, New Orleans is protected by a levee system that makes sure that it doesn't flood because technically it is underwater, it is under sea level. However, when Katrina hit, suddenly those levees were not working properly. The system that was designed by the United States government failed. The dam system or the levee system in New Orleans was not working. And this is due because of faulty engineering. Poor levee engineering. That's the human factor that I want you to put down. The government engineered the levee system in New Orleans very poorly. This could have been prevented. Lives would have not been lost and properties would not have been damaged if the United States government was careful in designing the levee system. But it was a poor design and New Orleans flooded in 2005. So this is one of the catastrophes the many bad things that happened during George W. Bush's presidency. This is not all his fault, he doesn't control hurricanes, but he could have designed those, or made the government design those levees better. This is the worst of it, 2008, we get a recession. Not quite a depression, we don't go all the way down to a depression, but this is a recession. In this class, we talked about that in the 70s, we had a recession. In the early 1990s, before the boom in the Bill Clinton's presidency, we had a recession. This is the worst one. We were on the brink of another depression. This is called the Great Recession in 2008. And some of your parents, and maybe some of your relatives, may have lost their house, may have lost their job during this recession. This was very, very close to a depression. And this is due because of the collapse of the housing market. The collapse of the housing market. All right, guys. So all remember, one of the causes of the Great Depression is government not regulating the economy enough. 
one of the causes of the depression back then in the 30s is people, banks, and investors were just investing their money very, very risky. And when the market crashed, they lost all their money, all the banks closed also, because government let them take those risks. After the depression and when the FDR comes in with the New Deal, we tried to regulate the economy. There are more rules that the government imposed on the economy. And some of those rules still stand today. But during the Bush administration, they took away some of those regulations. It's like we don't learn from history, but that's what happened. They took away some of those regulations that we've had since the Great Depression. Because their goal is to prevent something like that from ever happening again. So here's what they allowed banks to do. They allowed banks to pretty much loan money to whoever they want, especially when it comes to home loans or mortgages. Even people that are not trustworthy enough to pay back that loan, banks loaned money to them because they were allowed by who? By the government. The government didn't stop them from making these risky loans. And then when the market crashed and people couldn't pay back their loans to the, to the, to the banks, the banks also closed. So we get another economic catastrophe. So here's how the Bush administration tried to um, curtail the recession and prevent it from becoming a full-on depression. They passed a the law. The Emergency Economic Stabilization Act of 2008. We were on the brink of a depression, another depression. George W. Bush's administration decides to solve and prevent us from going into a full-on depression. So here's what the Bush administration is going to do. The Bush administration loaned government money to the banks. They loaned government money to the banks. Because what the government figured is, if the government let these banks fail, and if they let these banks close, the economy is going to get worse and people are going to lose their jobs and we're going to go on to a full de depression. So here's what the ironic thing about this whole thing is. The people that caused the recession in the first place, the banks who were making very risky loans, are getting money, your money, are getting money from who? So from the government, from your taxes. The government is helping them survive with your money. AIG, given $40 billion by the government. Bank of America, $45 billion. All of this is coming from your pockets. The people that have caused this housing crisis in the first place, suddenly they're getting punished with money from us. And this was a very controversial thing in the United States. A lot of people felt like we shouldn't be saving the people that actually caused the recession in the first place. And another kind of jerk thing that they did is a lot of these companies, after they received the loans, these loans from the federal government, uh, they gave some of it to the CEOs as a bonus. So they increased the bonus of some of these CEOs of these banks using our money. And again, this was your money being loaned to these banks because the Bush administration felt like they were too big to fail. That if they fail, we were going to go to a full-on depression. So by saving the bank, the U.S. government hoped to prevent a depression. They hoped to prevent a depression. Because if these banks fail, the economy is going to get worse, jobs are going to get lost. So the U.S. government will come in and save these banks. All right. After a disastrous presidency, two terms, George W. Bush steps down, and we get the election of 2008. A uh, historic moment in U.S. history because this is the first time an African-American president gets elected into office. This would have never been possible 20, decade, 20 years ago, 30 years ago. But this happened in your lifetime. An African American 
man being president of the United States. Unfortunately for him, he inherits the depression or the recession from George W. Bush, so he's the guy who's in charge of fixing the economy. So here's what Obama did, and this is still something that is in place today, and it's helping the economy recover. Our economy right now is doing well. It's doing great, partly because of him, partly because of Trump. But this is one of the things that he used to help the economy recover. It's called the American Recovery and Reinvestment Act of 2009. It's a stimulus package. The goal is, and some of this is going to sound familiar, so make sure you pay attention. The government is going to increase spending. It's going to create public works projects like bridges and dams and roads, thereby creating what? Jobs. jobs. The government is going to increase spending so that it can create jobs. That's going to encourage people to spend the money that they're earning, stimulating the economy. That's why this is called an economic stimulus package. The government will increase spending to encourage consumer spending. They're going to create jobs, and it's going to encourage people to spend money back into the economy. So create jobs, promote investments, and encourage consumer spending. What does that sound like, you all? FDR, when he was trying to fix what? The depression. the depression. This was very similar to the New Deal. Very similar to the New Deal. What did they do? Promote investments and encourage um, consumer spending. So government increased in spending, provided relief to a lot of people, created infrastructure so that it can create jobs, Increase ed, um, jobs in education and the workforce. All right, and it worked. The economy, little by little, by the time Obama got there, was recovering. What What's the bad part, though? The government is increasing spending. National debt. The national debt was also increasing. <coughs> We're now at like the twenty trillion dollars. Part of part of it is because of that. All right. Today, I'm going to teach you guys about something that's going to be kind of depressing for all of you. But hopefully I'm, I'm dead by the time you guys have to deal with it. In the United States, there's two types of government spending. There's discretionary spending, and there's also what we call mandatory spending. Discretionary spending is government spending that can be changed and adjusted from year to year. Um, that includes education and the military. So the education budget can be changed by the government from year to year. Sometimes it's going to be a lot, sometimes it's going to be very little. The military bu budget can also be changed, but it's always a lot. It's always around the $600 billion range. But Technically, tomorrow, Congress can decide to make it $5, and we'll just have like a little pea shooter for military. But it could be adjusted from year to year, easily adjusted from year to year. But most of our spending is not discretionary spending anymore, it's mandatory spending. Mandatory spending is spending that we've committed to by law, and it cannot be easily adjusted. It cannot be easily changed because we've committed to them in, uh, already. So think about it this way. Let's say you're living on your own. Um, discretionary spending would be the amount of money you spend on your clothes. Can you change that from week to week? Yes, yes. yes easily. What would be an example of mandatory spending for you if you're Bills. living on your own? Sorry? Bills. Bills, your rent, your electricity, that's, that's spending that you've committed to already. In the United States, most mandatory spending goes to entitlement programs like Social Security and Medicare. Social Security and Medicaid. So what are the programs? They're programs that benefit a certain population. These two benefit who? Old people. When was Social Security founded? What was this program founded? FDR. FDR is the New Deal. Medicare was founded during the Great Society with Lyndon B. Johnson. 
So this is spending that we've committed to, that we have to spend. Your grandparents, when they retire, they get a pension from the government. What do we call that? That's what? Social That's Social Security. And they also get government to provide them with health care. That was Medicare. That is spending that we committed. We promised them while they were working um, that they we're going to take a portion of their paycheck, give it to the government, and the promise is when they retire, they can reap the benefits by not working anymore, but they're still getting money from the government. Do you have any questions on that? That's part of mandatory spending. The problem is it has been increasing. The amount of money the U.S. government spends on town programs have been increasing. Here's the problem. We did not anticipate grandma living so long. Because when they made the calculations about Social Security and Medicare, people were not living as long. We didn't have the medical advances that we have today. So today we're kind of screwed because we're spending so much money because people are what? They're living longer. The longer they live, the more Medicare medical costs that we government has to pay for, we have to pay for. Uh, the more pension that we have to pay for. All right, so here's what's happening, and this is something that should be of note. Mandatory spending in the United States is increasing because more people are living longer. What that means is we don't, what would happen to discretionary spending? It's going to decrease because we're not going to have enough money because most of our money will be dedicated in paying off Social Security pensions and Medicare. Mandatory spending has been increasing while discretionary spending in this country has been decre decreasing. And these are important stuff like education in the military and space exploration. These are important types of spending, but pretty soon we're not going to have money anymore to be able to pay for those kinds of expenses because most of our money will be dedicated to mandatory spending. There's three ways to solve this. The first way, um, the first way is to increase what? So if you want more money, taxes. increase taxes, which is gonna be a very unpopular option. Our politicians will never do that because their jobs are on the line. So they'll never propose an increase in taxes. Another option will be telling your grandma <laughs> Sorry, but we can't. We have to cut down your pension or we have to cut your Medicare, which is also going to be very difficult because most of the people that vote in this country are who? Oh, are old people. And they want to protect those benefits. The third option is the one that we've been using, which is to spend more money than we actually have, which will increase the what? The national, national debt. The debt that you all have to pay. So pretty soon we're going to have to deal with this problem but that's the result. The result is the national debt is increasing. Alright, next. There was an increase in migration in the 2000s for economic opportunities. And I'm talking about here legal and illegal immigration. So economic opportunities, escape, political instability. These are always the reasons why immigrants come over to the United States. For a better world, for a better life, economic opportunity, and escape political instability. The result is an increase in population in the United States. We have a huge immigrant population here in this country. We've always been a country of immigrants. So escape political instability, increase in population is the result, especially in the cities of the United States where a lot of these opportunities are available. So increase in, in population, especially in the cities. Another result is something that you guys had on your test, cultural diffusion. Have a good day, guys. Make sure you're studying for your AP exam. We don't have a lot of time left. Have a good day, guys. Eight and ten.